that said, welcome back, guys. And we're down to the final two. The, the favorites got the job done. This week, there was no upsets. And with me to discuss Argentina, Croatia, and France, Morocco, I'm here with Oscar and Mikhail. And we're going to start with Morocco. And we're going to give them a small round of applause. Yes, they made it this far, but unfortunately, they had to go. And France, <laughs> they got the job done. And I'm going to start with you, Mikhail, because France, they did something that they've done throughout this World Cup and last World Cup. They've underwhelmed, but they still, they still got the win. They didn't need to do much to get this win. Yeah, um... The, I think I guess it's important to note their manager, um, Didier Deschamps, is uh, a key figure of 1990s Italian club football. So his teams pretty much epitomize that, where it's just set up in a strong defensive structure. And they're hard to break down. Um, and with the attacking players they have, I mean, they just create a fair amount of chances throughout the course of a game as well. Um, today was interesting, though, their approach. Um, they, like, clearly just kind of allowed Morocco to just have possession of the ball. They had 56% possession. Or uh, Morocco, or 60%, pardon me, Morocco had today, which is... Um, a fair amount of the ball, which also kind of just shows what France's approach was essentially. Yeah, that's some stat because during the game, when I saw the possession stat, I had to look it up and I, I realized that Morocco, in all their previous games, they've had less possession than the opponent, which is wild. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's been 36%, Croatia, 33% against Belgium, 41% against Canada, 25% against Spain, 25% against Portugal. So to have 56% today mm. against the former champions from four years ago is definitely a different type of game for them. Yeah, definitely. And did France scoring first, did it affect the way Morocco played? Was that like the perfect game plan? Because they scored first, they scored super early. And it seems from them they had to force Morocco to do things that they were not used to, which is to come out and really dictate the game. Yeah, no, that's definitely a huge takeaway as to scoring early. That's a, I guess, perhaps it's like a trend that we've seen so far in this knockout competition. Thus far, it's when you score goals, it kind of allows you to like, essentially kind of form like a mid block, low block in defense, especially if you have the players to enable you to do so. Um, yeah. But, oh no, pardon, sorry. <laughs> and, and even with that, like from there, you, you start to see Morocco, they did create some chances. They did have some of the half chances going into the half. The bicycle kick from El Yamik was like very close. Like, I'm not sure whether they hit the bar or Yuri's got his fingertips on it, but that was a really crucial chance that could have changed the dynamic of that game. Yeah, definitely. That was a very, very good chance. Um, they had, yeah, they had a number of decent opportunities in the first half. I mean, the second half, those first 15 to 20 minutes were, they were really impressive. I mean, I think their game plan was just clearly to attack France left side with Mbappe not really a player that tracks back. And then, um, based off of the previous game with, uh, Teo Hernandez, who's brilliant going forward, but defensively is a little, a little bit vulnerable. Um, we saw Jiek, Hakimi, and uh, Anahi just clearly uh, trying, attempting to attack that side, where they did create a number of chances as well. Um, I thought the best chance, perhaps, was from their substitute, Hamdala, who perhaps should have passed. He had an opportunity to pass it to player on his left or player on his right off of a uh, a Chumani mistake in in his uh, final third, or in uh, his defensive third. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, but all in all, I mean, they should be extremely proud. It's this is an accomplishment that, and you know, they just simply just broke a glass ceiling, essentially, 
that that continent had had not been successful in doing for a number of years. Yeah, and that that's what I feel like is so great about this Morocco story is that right from the get go, no one really gave them a chance to advance, and they did that. And it's like they advanced to the semifinals not by beating rookie teams, but they've beaten like, for example, I think Argentina will get onto at a much easier path than Morocco did in that Morocco had to play Spain, they had to play Portugal. And one thing that's been the strength of this competition has been the fact they've brought in so many fans into the stadium. And I almost feel that's an X factor for Morocco and for Argentina in that every game feels like a home game for them. And they have the fans supporting them. Like every time French touched, touched the ball, there were like boos, there were things to get players off the game. And every time Morocco advanced, there was chairs galore. And I really like that. And I really felt they brought their full selves into this World Cup. Yeah, definitely. The crowd played a huge impact in terms of being a, a 12th man um, for, a, you know, when moments were low, perhaps after conceding an early goal. It's really the fans that are kind of, you know, pushing the team essentially to try to try to get another one back. But yeah, I mean, yeah, the crowd was was very, very impressive all in all throughout the course of the tournament. I mean, they were pretty much a home side, <laughs> um, <laughs> which is something, you know, any team would want. Yeah, it's something definitely any team would want. But let's talk about France for a bit. Let's go through the goals. The first one, like, there and I is, like, you mentioned it's good going forward, and that was a brilliant finish, wasn't it, to beat Bono? But I feel that the Moroccan defenders could have done a bit better in covering. Yeah, I thought there were a few defensive lapses, perhaps. Um, I mean, the clear one was uh, Yamik, who was the um, left center back out of the five, who... Griezmann was in the offside position. I think he came towards the ball. And then Yamik, I think, just essentially tried to win the ball from a pass and just just wasn't able to win it. Yeah. And just multiple sort of deflections here and there. Mbappe, obviously, Mbappe in the box is very, very difficult to, uh, to defend. I also thought this might be perhaps harsh, but Bono, I think... Uh, had uh, this is we're talking split second decisions here, but I thought he could have perhaps pressured Hernandez a bit more as the ball was in the air. I mean that that is possibly harsh. It's just again like we're split second decisions here. But when the ball is coming and he realizes that Hernandez isn't going to head it, then I think that's like time for him to try to close the gap a little bit, perhaps. Yeah, because like a goalkeeper shouldn't leave that much space for Hernandez to get a shot away, and it seems he had a clear shot on this goal yeah for it's, it's yeah it's one of those goals though to concede that it's just it's mostly like you don't want to concede a goal against such a good team in the first what like fourth minute fifth minute of a game yeah, yeah. but in terms of but, the second goal though it was all class there was all class from France. like the movement for that goal shows why they're such a great side yeah, it's, it was quite sensational for my hobby. <laughs> Just that ingenuity of kind of manipulating the ball in such a tight, tight space. Um, Especially, and, yeah. And uh, up to that point, I felt Mbappe hadn't really done much in the game, but like you said, in the in the box, he's so dangerous. He creates so many opportunities, and that final pass shows why he's such a highly rated player. And must be the best player in the world at the moment. Yeah, definitely. I mean, we saw with um, in that that movement, M um, Amrabat essentially kind of just stay put at the top of his box, not even attempting a tackle on Mbappe because he just the speed of him. It's if you touch him or if you attempt to tackle and you don't get the ball, it's, I mean, you're just clearly at a risk of um, conceding a penalty. Yeah, for sure. And that, that we have it. Like, with France, though, what do you think is the legacy of Deschamps? Like, regardless of whether they win or not, do you think if he leaves the French national team, do you think he's done a great job based on Oh, yeah, I think, I think it'll be a tremendous job. Um, it's still one of those that, you know, 
looking back at 2018, there was always a slight amount of backlash for his approach, essentially, where it's, you know, relying on counterattack when you have the players that are actually extremely good. You know, it's one of those teams, even if you look at it now with the players that they have, that you... This is clearly a team that could um, just dictate the entire game by possessing the ball a bit more, pressing yeah. the ball perhaps a bit more. But they, their reliance is clearly on the foundation of um, counterattacking. But when they need to, they do have the players to try to break teams down. But, I mean, to win uh, back-to-back tournaments for the first time since Brazil did it, in 58 to 62. I mean, that would be something very, very special indeed, especially yeah. in the modern era as well, as well, where um, the pool of teams that are in this tournament is just significantly better. Yet there's more rounds that you have to get to in order to reach the finals as well. It will be as well. And let's not forget, as you mentioned, um, France, they can win it back to back with Deschamps. He also got them to a Euro 2016 final. And I remember a quote from Carlo Ancelotti after Spain went out and he said that he's not ashamed to look for the counterattack. And I guess that's what Deschamps is doing. Like they can play when they want to, but if their game plan sit back and let the play happen, that's what they do. And it's worked for them successfully. Yeah, very much so. It's, it's, it's been pretty much a perfect system for what, uh, will be just, what 13 games now i guess yeah going back to 2018 yeah there, there have been moments though that you might think that they haven't been the best team um at the england game i guess their last match they perhaps had moments where it's you know like where england could have perhaps had that harry kane penalty went in it would have been a bit more difficult but yeah. You know, so far they've been they've been good enough where it's you're reaching the finals yeah. for the World Cup. Yeah, that, that's very true. And I'm gonna bring Oscar in to discuss like how Argentina is going to stop this amazing France side. But first of all, let's talk about Argentina in general in their game against Croatia because I thought that was sensational against Croatia. I expected this to be a much tighter game. But Messi and Julian Alvarez are the couple of the tournaments, aren't they? Yeah, yeah. It was the game was you know easier than I expected. You know, Croatia actually started the game pretty well, but then you know Argentina grew into it, and those two quick goals in the space of five minutes just totally flipped everything. And from there, you know, Croatia. The thing with Croatia was that I said if Argentina had to win this thing, to put them away quickly and not give them that chance to do what Croatia do, which is to stay alive and come back and take it to extra time. So, yeah, it was good that Argentina did it. You know, it was, like you say, it's a great match from Messi and Alvarez. They just yeah. have had really good tournaments. And, yeah, it gives you a lot of confidence for Sunday. Yeah, let's go through the first goal because that was controversial. You think that was a penalty. And, Mikhail, feel free to give your opinion on this. But, Oscar, was it a penalty? To be honest, I don't really know. It's more, I haven't really looked back at that penalty, to be honest. I was just happy it was given. <laughs> but I I guess it's the kind of penalty or the kind of problem we have where if the referee makes that decision, it's not a clear and obvious error, I guess. So yeah. VAR doesn't take a look at it. It just adds to the inconsistencies and problems you generally have with VAR and stuff. But I guess I'll say 60 40 is a penalty. 6 is a penalty. And Mikhail, what do you think about that call? Um, yeah, I think it was. If What's interesting is in the Argentina Poland game, there was a penalty that Messi got um, from, uh, I guess, Chesney. Yeah, Chesney kind of punched him in a way. He was a little late to challenge the ball. Messi had headed the ball. The ball went out for what would have been a goal kick, but mm-hmm. um, yeah, that was ended. That was called a penalty. So as soon as I saw this Alvarez one, just based off of consistency, mm-hmm. I thought that that would clearly be a foul. But I mean, 
in this case, if a player nutmegs another player anywhere on the pitch, yeah. the ball goes through the player and that player obstructs you. I mean, that that is a foul. Yeah. Yeah. But I guess the argument um, to play devil's advocate would be like the goalkeeper is already planted at his feet. Like he's, there's nowhere he can go at that point. Hmm. Yeah, perhaps. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. I, haven't, I haven't gone through that. Let's go through the second goal because was that more of Alvarez's tenacity or poor defending by Croatia? Because I feel Alvarez is really smart and Nawa Molina, who makes the underlapping, overlapping run, <laughs> was actually really smart because it takes away defender and Alvarez takes it up and he's like dribbling past Croatia defenders. He's like trying to get past them and the attempts to stop him are quite comical in a way. <laughs> but yeah. I don't know. I think that was a great goal by him too. Yeah, I believe it was a good goal and I feel it's more down to his tenacity than anything. <laughs> it is. A, I feel it's like his tenacity causes the horrible defending so both are kind of linked. Yeah. But in the third goal it was the messy show and I felt like Maybe he's like that level of skill was beyond him at that at this age at this stage of an international competition. But that was Maradona esque when he did that. What he did to Graviol was criminal. Yeah, <laughs> he <laughs> <for that. laughs> yeah he, he totally reduced his transfer market value. If anyone wants Vardio, now is the time to get to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean that was just beautiful. Like from the touch to like start the move and then just leaving Vardial standing there was was unfair but that's messy for you he's done that so many times and it was great to see this guy still has this in him <laughs> yeah because Julian Alvarez gets the credit for the goal but that's, that's the thing <laughs> in the last two games there have been t- Messi has had two assists where everyone's initial reaction after the goal goes in is Messi how did you do that as a guest <laughs> And you have Molina and Alvarez being like, wow, really, guys? <laughs> yeah, but credit, I mean, you have to credit the scorer, too, and credit yeah. the beautiful place by Messi. Yeah, we have credit them. And credit to Julian Alvarez, because like, he's been a standout in this tournament, hasn't he? Because I know there's a lot of talk about the Moroccan players and the guys in the team, but he's really stepped up. And for all Argentina in history with Messi, there's always been conversation as people who support Argentina have said, I wish Messi had a partner that could support him. And in this World Cup, Alvarez has been Messi's partner in crime. He's just been there scoring goals, being there just in decisive moments. For example, I think it's the second goal against, was it Mexico, where he's like super vigilant and the keeper makes a mistake and he pounces. Oh, it was against Australia. Australia, my bad. Yeah, for my triad. Yeah, my, my uh, boy. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, but Alvarez has really grown into the role of Messi's partner and Argentina's number nine because after that Saudi Arabia game, you know, Scaloni decided to make a lot of huge calls, you know, dropping Lautaro, Papu, um, Paredes. And I have to say, a lot of those calls he's made have paid off marvelous because. It's not just Lothar, uh, well, I say Lothar. <laughs> Alvarez, you have the likes of Enzo and Acuna who came back into his side and have done well, McAllister. Yeah. So, yeah, it's, overall, I feel this tournament has really boosted Alvarez's value and just makes people feel sorry for him that he has to play second field to Her- <laughs> Erling Haaland. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's 20 million that uh, Man City paid. It's like, Absolute steal. Yeah, it's a steal. You might criticize Man City for like for other stuff that he do that's like mm-hmm. financially doping, but that was smart business from them. Um, Mikhail, you've seen a lot of Manchester City. Like, what did you expect this of Alvarez coming into the World Cup? Um. Yes. Like, I mean, I thought it would be a matter of if he got an opportunity to, but the guy's a machine. Like, just kind of going uh, off of the goal that his first goal. Um, in this game, I don't. It was actually a short corner that Croatia ran, and Alvarez is standing at this, you know, in within his six yard box, yeah. and he sprints towards Brozovic, blocks the cross that leads to Otamendi pass, heading it to Messi, which eventually ends up with Alvarez. It's that sort of, you know, the value of just a 
a striker that's clinical that is just so energetic essentially like a midfielder's like legs and lung yeah. is something that's just very very valuable this day and age but yeah he man city it's just been the issue of you know holland is just a generational player plus also with guardiola teams though it takes a little bit of time for players to kind of embed themselves in the system i mean we've seen it with like very good players now like rodri bernardo silva it took them time to bet in so it honestly just might be a matter of working out a way if he can play off of off of holland some way or one way or another but yeah i mean he's definitely going to be a key player for them uh for years to come yeah he'll definitely be a key player for them and oscar now Argentina are doing the final. The key question is, can Messi do it? <laughs> he do it again. He says this is going to be... Do what again? Uh, no, not do it again, but like, put back that performance again. Can he do oh, okay. that performance? This is going to be his last final. He's obviously set, set in the stage. Amazon are preparing their um, All or Nothing documentary. Like, will Messi... Will, will it be a happy ending for in that All or Nothing documentary? I mean, I hope so. But what I want and uh, reality are two different things. <laughs> and yeah, seeing that it's France is going to be a really difficult game. I'm really interested to see how two teams go about it because as you can see from your possession stats, Argentina dominated the game, but I guess because they kind of relaxed towards the end, yeah. they had like less than 40% of the ball against Croatia and they had less against Netherlands, I guess. Both teams are teams that are more like, if you're willing to take the ball from us, we'll happily give it to you. So I'm interested to see who takes this um, stage in terms of domination in this match. Yeah, I feel Argentina might be more protagonist than France, but it all depends on who scores first. So with that said, I think Argentina have a good habit of scoring first, so I'm going to... You can say they uh, just hope so. <laughs> and then and then unlike some of the last sixteen and quarter final games where they kind of let opponents back in, I hope they're able to see it out if they get the lead. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, not sounding very confident there. But Argentina mm-hmm. in this game, they changed the, the shape of the of the team because they went back to a back four. They mm-hmm. played with four central midfielders, which is sort of Diego Simeone esque. Yeah. <laughs> what they used to play with Saul, Gabi, Thiago, and Koke. Okay, yeah. <laughs> and it, it, that sort of worked for them because I was a bit scared for, for, of Argentina going into this game because Croatia had that midfield of Brozovic, mm-hmm. Modric, and Kovacic, who we praised. But it seems like that change sort of worked. Do you think, do you think he stays with that midfield four or he goes back to the back five? I don't think. He should go back. He should go to a back five. I feel the back five was just because Netherlands played with two strikers, and I was going to mention this about Morocco. When I saw their lineup was a back five, I put my hand in my head because I knew what was coming. Because <laughs> um, it is that if you're going to a back five for the sake of wanting to defend, I feel like it usually comes back to bite you. Because if you're a team that's not used to playing that system. You can make mistakes like El Yamik did today, like where you just you're you're essentially caught in no man's land as against what you usually do. Yeah. So, and because France just played Giroud up front, I feel like playing a back five from the start to be a waste. Yeah. I feel what Argentina are better served doing is starting with the back four, and then depending on the game state, if you're winning, switch to that back five, bring the Sandro in. So, yeah, I feel he could go with the same team. Yeah. And I guess bring Di Maria in for Paredes. Paredes? Ah, but if Di Maria comes in, doesn't that... I guess I guess with France, right, they play with a 4-2-3-1 or hybrid 4-3-3. Mm-hmm. I'm just worried, like, if Di Maria comes in, it's going to be... They aren't going to have that superiority in midfield like they had against Croatia. True, there's that, there's that. Okay, I see what you're saying. Yeah. Okay, I think, I didn't think of that, but putting that in mind, I guess if it's not broken, don't fix it. <laughs> yeah. And does Weber Acuna come back in? 
uh, Tagafico did a good job against um, Croatia, but I think Tag. So I think Acuna probably comes back in. Yeah, and how how do you think Argentina can stop not just Mbappe but like the entire French attack? Because on one hand we're going to get Dembele versus Acuna, and Dembele wins that in La Liga as we come accustomed to, and then it's Mbappe versus Molina on the other side. Yeah. And not for well, there's Antoine Griezmann who is on fire. Team. That, that's the main person I feel Argentina like should watch out for. So, packing the midfield, having an extra body on Griezmann would definitely help. I also feel like what Argentina needs to do is just if you're they're capable of controlling the game, so you just have to avoid careless turnovers that can just give France clear pass to counter attack like. England kind of did. I know some of the England stuff, there were some fouls not given, but still, you have to avoid certain turnovers. I feel having four midfielders, they take care of the ball better than yeah, Di Maria, who take more risks. Yeah, that, that's very true. And Macau, I'm good to come to you from the French perspective. Uh, French, France brought in Fofana today, who did a good job. Do you see them making any changes to, this, to the lineup they played today? in order to beat Argentina? Um, I think if Rabio is healthy, he apparently was bedridden today, so I don't know how optimistic that sounds for Sunday. It's still a while away, but I think Rabio will be the only change. Yeah. Um, it was also interesting. Konate had a very, very good game today, I thought. Yeah. Um, who came in for... Upamecano, who was yeah. the club last week. Yeah, he also was allegedly dealing with flu-like symptoms. But, I mean, based off of the previous game, I think we, we mentioned uh, last time that Kanate would likely... Uh, it wouldn't surprise us if we saw him in the starting 11. But yeah, I think it'll be pretty much the same sort of setup. Yeah, um, um, what will be from a, for France to win this? Sorry. I think it'll be pretty much some of the same things. I think they will essentially try to concede possession of the ball to Argentina. I mean, whether or not Argentina also concedes <laughs> is something that is clearly plausible. I mean, yeah. Scaloni's seemed to do a lot of different um, things with his tactics and strategies, which is pretty impressive. Yeah. That I mean, I, it wouldn't surprise me if it's one of those classic <laughs> games of, like, no, you have the ball, no, you have the ball yeah. sort of scenarios, but I think one thing that they might be a little bit um, wary of is perhaps the midfield. Like, I mean, thus, like, again, Shimani Griezmann, whether it's Fofana or Rabia, there are moments against Morocco where their midfield just struggled a little bit. They just didn't have much control on the game here and there. Um, I mean, in Argentina are just better. They have just better players than Morocco do in the center of the pitch in terms of controlling the ball. And obviously Messi is essentially like a fourth center midfielder when he drops and runs. Yeah, because that means so, that Argentina would have like five people in that midfield and maybe they can have runners like Acuna and Molina going forward, which could cause France some problems. But like the thing with France though is like their athletes at the back just make them look so unbeatable. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they're, I mean, that's one of the virtues. Let's not forget that uh, um, the other Hernandez brother was essentially seen as the, the the starter. So it's three class center backs, essentially, yeah. was the initial plan. But one area of vulnerability, though, I still think is Teo Hernandez defensively. Yeah, who was the manager I, of the last game? Yeah, no, for definitely. He's, I mean, yeah. he's, I mean, in world football, he perhaps is the best left back at going forward. But that just might be an area as well that Argentina might seem to exploit, depending on Di Maria's health. Yeah, and what perhaps about even for, Alvarez? What about for Argentina? What what are if you are Didier Deschamps and you're given like the tactical speech to the French players? Where are you telling them to attack Argentina? Do you think? It's the midfield, it's the wingers, or it's the wingbacks for Argentina. Do you think that will be where the weakness will be? 
Oh, it's definitely the the fullbacks. I mean, perhaps the biggest one of the biggest virtues of the French team is they have um, wide forwards who are very good, very very good at progress- progressing the ball and driving the ball themselves. That's something that's actually quite. I mean, I think only Brazil is like the only other team that just clearly has players like that on both flanks. I think that's just an area that they should be trying to exploit every single time they they get the ball. Essentially, you know, Mbappe one on one, hopefully against um, Molino and vice yeah, versa yeah. with Dembele against Acuna, likely. Yeah, and, and and I think from an Argentinian point of view, and Oscar, you can feel free to join the conversation as well. Is that that's what really worries me for them is that matchup between the wingers of France and fullbacks of Argentina because I think that might be lopsided. Yeah, it kind of just seems unfair. Especially if Argentina are playing without wingers. So, yeah, I feel based off what they did against Brazil in the last Copa America, we'll see a lot of DePaul trying to help, you know, um, help Molina and McAllister trying to help um, Acuna. But, yeah, definitely if those two fullbacks are left on their own, it could be troublesome, <laughs> especially with Mbappe because we know what we're going to get from him. With Dembele, you know, from club experience, the guy is like this. One day he's great, the other day he's not so great. So, it, But for, you know, just to be on the safe side, it's better to back up the fullbacks. Yeah, it's yeah definitely... I... oh, sorry. sorry, go on, Maka. No, I was just going to say, I think the Argentina midfield, in terms of preventing distribution towards particularly Mbappe, I think might be vital. Um, they just have the sort of mobility um, of players that are just very good in the tackle, highly intelligent, also mm-hmm. very good in possession when they do regain the ball. I think that might... Something along those lines, perhaps, is you know, just essentially having someone shadow like Griezmann all the time in the sense where it's just like he's like the player that can kind of push, pull the strings, essentially. Yeah, that, that that's definitely true. I feel maybe cutting up that supply line to the wings might be the best way, knowing that your fullbacks have a disadvantage against Argentinian um, French wingers. But now that yeah. we we somewhat previewed the game, guys, how do you think this game is going to go? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> I'm I'm speaking with my heart at this point. My head is out of the window. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to say Argentina will be able, like, because Mikhail has said, Scaloni in the last two games has managed to adjust his tactics to the opposition. So that's why I think. I'm kind of thinking he'll play three midfielders and bring Di Maria in for the purpose of targeting Tio Hernandez and for the purpose of just having wits because having too many midfielders in a game like this might not be a good thing all the time, especially as France just have two plus Griezmann. Yeah. And like we said, Messi can easily drop and make what would be a fifth midfielder in this case, which yeah. I don't think would be necessary. So it depends on... That tactic. So yeah, um, let's see what Mikael has to say before I give my final judgment. Yeah, I'm not sure. Uh, I'm actually surprised how I, it took them a while to get going, but how comfortable Argentina beat Croatia, and they've really grown into the tournament game by game almost. I think they might just edge it out. I'm not super confident, but just other elements like pretty much home support as well. Yeah, if it's right. been the same, it's just something that's extreme. Like you know, especially in a final, is just very very useful to have just yeah. a crowd just cheering and cheering and singing and driving the team forward. Yeah. That, that's I also think that we have to keep in mind that France's performances haven't been as good. I mean, they still won the World Cup last time by just cruising through, essentially. They're that good, but 
if France don't address those concerns in midfield and don't protect Tio better, I feel like that's where Argentina can win the game. Because if if Tio has both Di Maria and Messi to deal with, then that's that's not that's not fair on any fullback, honestly. So yeah, yeah we'll have to see. It could also be a hybrid, right? Because Di Maria and Messi could go after Tio. Molina is also someone who's very attacking. But if Molina mm-hmm. decides to stay back. Acuna can be that sort of left winger on the other side, so mm-hmm. that, that could be fun to watch. I, in a way, I wouldn't even be. I'm just look, just thinking about this. I wouldn't even be surprised if Messi kind of just starts essentially, just kind of on the right hand side, just off of the right hand side, where it's still like you have a midfield three and Alvarez, mm-hmm. yeah, up top. But I mean, like, because you know, Conde isn't going to drive forward that much, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. yeah. So maybe you can kind of have a bit of a lopsided. Sort of often. I don't know. It's just fascinating. Yeah, it is. And do you guys think, like, like with Argentina sending back, they might have some problems with the sexy, the magnificent Olivier Giroud? Uh, yeah, that's another thing. <laughs> <laughs> the, yeah. Um, Giroud's height is going to be a problem. So, and not just his height, his whole, overall build up play is absolutely great. So, the t- the good thing with Argentina centre backs is down the floor they're very active in trying to you know stop cent- centre backs from laying off the ball. In the air they're good, but Giroud is a monster, so we'll have to see about that. Yeah, we'll have to see. So Oscar, you haven't given us your final prediction in for this game. I'll go with my prediction from the last game, Argentina. Argentina? Okay, yeah. And who do you think is going to be the one that makes that difference to make Argentina win? Will it be Messi, like in the semifinal? Um, it will be Dybala. Dybala? <laughs> just so, you, just put, you just put me on the spot, so I just picked the first name that came up. Okay, let's look at it like this. Yeah. There are situations where the baller could come off the bench. If Argentina are somehow having the easiest game of their life, or if they're chasing. So I feel someone like him on the pitch could make a difference, I guess. Just I mean obviously Messi will be messy to some degree. So yeah. I'm just thinking of someone else. And I feel Alvarez will also be really important. But, yeah. Macau? Um, I think it'll be Argentina in extra time. Um, if it does reach that stage, though, I definitely favor the sort of options Scaloni can bring off the bench. Um, that's mostly due to a lot of the injuries that France have dealt with in the last number of months. But to bring in, whether it's Laura Martinez, whether it's Angel Di Maria off the bench, or just additional midfielders, too, Plus the ability to change the shape as well. Um, with my, um, gosh, Lissandra. Uh, Lissandra Martinez, too. It's just options that he has. Yeah, yeah. And, and if he wants to play more defensive right back, you can always play Juan Foy. I'm not sure how fit he is for the World Cup, but mm-hmm. you can always play him because like, he has that defensive center and he, he's not too bad going forward. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's just that Molina has been playing so well in the knockout stuff. Yeah. It's be, it'll, be it, it'll definitely be a question, like, why did you change this if it doesn't work? Sure. That, that, that is very true. Uh, I guess for I mean, me... He did, he did come off the bench last game, so... Yeah, he did. I mean, I know it was mostly to... But, but I think it was like when everyone... Else. Save some legs. Yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. but... Like, everyone, Dybala was coming in, Angel Carrillo was coming in. <laughs> <laughs> But it could be just that, but then with Scaloni, who knows? Maybe he knows something we don't. Yeah. <laughs> yes, for sure. Like he, he's he's been underrated as a manager because he's mm-hmm. won Argentina in the first trophy in God knows how many years. He's um gotten them to World Cup final again, and this is like it's an Argentina team that we've always known had that talent going back through the years, but no. But he has brought the talents out like he has. Mm-hmm. And even after the first game, the humility to make those changes, the tactical awareness to put the players where they're meant to be, it's, it's impressive for, for a guy like him who's 
pretty much unknown in European soccer parlance. Mm -hmm. He took over as a caretaker manager, which just makes it even more just crazy. <laughs> Due to the, you know, the essentially lack of money, because when they fired Sampaioli, it's like to buy him off, essentially. They had no money to like buy a, another manager, pretty much. He was a scout for them in the 2018 World Cup. So it's just like... Yeah, Keen is the best option. And I really love his like assistance, uh, Samuel Aymar. But anyways, this isn't the Argentina podcast. If people support France, so <laughs> let's give them both. We've given France some love, haven't we? Uh, yeah. It's like, in my opinion, I, I, I don't know. In my head, I think the Cristiano fan and Kylian Mbappe would make him want to stop Messi. <laughs> and. <laughs> France might win, but my heart's telling me that Argentina might win. My heart's telling me, but I don't want to believe that because last time I believed my heart, Mario Gotti broke it into a million pieces. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, there is one thing that I've looked at that makes me feel Argentina like when it's not related to the well, actual say, abilities of it. You're going to kick us. No, will or won't, whatever, but I'm not going to say the exact thing because. <laughs> That would be a jinx, but I mean, it seems that these two teams are really good teams, and I feel it might. Be, I feel it will be very close. Yeah. Hopefully, for the sake of just tormenting every single person on the planet, it goes to penalties. <laughs> if it goes to penalties, I mean, uh, I mean, I mean, Martinez has his reputation, but every game is different, so. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's true. Any final words, Mikhail? No, I just think it'll be a very... I mean, actually, I don't th I don't know if it'll be. It might be one of those games that's just very cagey yeah. as well. So it might perhaps not be the best... Uh, the most aesthetic thing to watch by any means. But I'm ho I hope I'm wrong, though. I'm really yeah. looking forward to an early goal from one of the teams that will... Force. Yeah. It didn't feel yeah, like a was, 40, was... to be honest. <laughs> yeah, was, yeah. Yeah, but that, that was down to, like, just Argentina's defense back then and goalkeeper being so bad, but, you know. <laughs> and just kind of, like, issues with their manager. Yeah. yeah. The, <laughs> the less said about that one, the better, but, yeah. <laughs> I feel like Mikhail said this game, because both teams are teams that would rather let you dominate them to some degree, it might be a bit cagey, but we'll see yeah. how the main players on each team take control of the game. Yeah, we shall see. And there we have it. The final, that's the glamorous one that we wanted. We might have gotten Messi versus Ronaldo, the War of the Goats, but we have the King against his potential successor. Messi and Mbappe, who's going to take the control? We'll find that out next week on La Cancha. Thanks for listening, guys. Adios.